Hey there, pals. I've noticed a lot of you tuning into my channel, but haven't hit that subscribe button yet. If you enjoy my stories, consider subscribing. Thanks a bunch. Now, let me introduce myself. I'm John, and I've proudly served in the Special Forces for more than 13 years. My journey began when I enlisted at the ripe age of 21, fueled by a strong desire to serve my country and make a positive impact on the world. Since then, I've been through three challenging tours of duty, spanning across dangerous territories worldwide. These deployments often kept me away from home for extended periods, but alongside my tight-knit squad of six, we'd faced every challenge, forming an unbreakable bond along the way. Between deployments, my squad, and I make it a priority to reconnect, usually with a monthly barbecue or some other small gathering. It's our way of unwinding from the stresses of battle and remembering the families we have waiting for us back home. Speaking of home, I met my wife, Sarah, back in high school. We rekindled our connection after I finished basic training and eventually tied the knot. Sarah has been my rock throughout this journey, understanding and supporting my military commitments despite the frequent separations. Whenever I had leave, we cherished our time together making every moment count. At the time of the life-altering event, I'm about to share Sarah, and I had been happily married for over 11 incredible years. At the age of 35, I found myself and my 34-year-old wife owning a comfortable home in a neighborhood close to the military base where I was stationed. Many of my squad mates also resided in the same community, allowing us to easily gather regularly Little did I know that our seemingly idyllic lives would be shattered after a particular barbecue. It began like any other monthly gathering, with myself and the five other members of my squad enjoying a sunny Saturday afternoon at Mike's place. We were savouring beer and grilling steaks in his backyard. Meanwhile, our wives were having their own gathering down the street in my house, engaging in the usual bonding over wine and gossip. Everything appeared normal and relaxed until we realized we had run out of beer at Mike's after about an hour. Without hesitation, I volunteered to walk over to my house just a short distance away to fetch more drinks from the extra cases I kept in my garage fridge. On my way, I took a slightly unconventional route, cutting through a neighbor's yard first to grab some folding chairs from my storage shed for the guys. As I approached my back door and entered the kitchen, the sounds of Sarah and the other wives chatting and giggling in the next room reached my ears. Initially, I thought nothing of it, assuming it was innocent catching up. However, as I drew closer, the conversation I unintentionally overheard made me freeze in my tracks. There was no mistaking the heartbreaking revelation. My loyal wife, to whom I had been faithfully committed for over a decade, was nonchalantly confessing to cheating on me. My heart sank and my gut twisted as I stood there in stunned silence, forced to confront the painful details of the betrayal. The recollection unfolded like a vivid nightmare, each painful detail etched with excruciating clarity. Once filled with the comforting embrace of trust, Asayara's words now reverberate with a cruel and gut-wrenching resonance. Her once excited tone, now tainted by betrayal, permeates the air as she enthusiastically recounts her rendezvous with other men during my deployment. Each word of the emotional dialogue carries a sting of betrayal, her descriptions dripping with explicit and graphic details. The sunny memories of her voice are now overshadowed by the dark clouds of deception. The room, previously alive with the warmth of shared confidences, turns a sea as S.A.R. proudly compares the physical attributes of her various lovers. A declaration about one being the largest she's ever had cuts through the air, a sharp reminder of the intimate details she willingly shared with callous disregard. The setting transforms into a painful tableau as the wives openly discuss their sexual escapades within the confines of my own home. In what used to be sacred spaces, now reduced to mere cheap motels and my car, the echoes of our shared love fade into oblivion. The once tender emotional dialogues are replaced by crude exchanges of secrets and lies as S.A.R. and the others delve into the art of deception, 
sharing tips on maintaining secret email accounts and burner phones. The room metamorphoses into a den of duplicity. The emotional dialogue becomes a sinister symphony of deceit, a shared knowledge of clandestine tools weaving a web that tightens around the core of trust. With each insult hurled at me and their husbands, SAR, and her cohorts brazenly label us clueless idiots for placing our trust in them. The echoes of their scorn linger in the air, staining the memories of shared laughter and intimacy irreparably. The bitter taste of betrayal lingers in the air, cutting through like a chilling wind. What once felt like an intimate connection now seems like a distant memory. The weight of their callous gossip becomes a haunting refrain that refuses to fade with time. The everyday talk of infidelity, once unthinkable, now stands as a chilling testament to shattered trust. As I stood there, the scars of betrayal etched on the canvas of my past, I honestly thought I might vomit or pass out right then and there. The life I thought I knew came crashing down around me. The woman I had sacrificed everything for, whom I believed embodied loyalty and family values, was casually betraying me without a hint of guilt or remorse. It wasn't just a one-time mistake. It was calculated, long-running affairs with multiple men, whose identities she mocked me by withholding. I felt deeply violated, knowing these strangers had been in my own home, my bed, acting out their sordid trysts, while I was overseas trying to make the world suffer. It took every ounce of special forces training, I had to suppress the rage and anguish threatening to overwhelm me. Part of me wanted to burst in and confront Sarah, to make her pay for the unimaginable pain she had inflicted on me and our marriage. But I knew I couldn't let on that I had overheard anything. Not yet. I needed time to think and strategize before she could attempt to cover her tracks. So I turned slowly, grabbed a case of beer from the garage, and walked steadily back to Mike's house. Despite the sense that my world was collapsing, I'm certain the guys immediately sensed a heavy burden on me when I returned. They wisely refrained from prying, and I simply informed them that I was feeling suddenly unwell, not exactly a lie. That night, lying in bed next to Sarah, I struggled to control my pounding heart and overwhelming nausea. Questions raced through my mind. How long has she been living this double life? How could I have been so blind? Why wasn't I enough for her? The woman peacefully sleeping next to me in the darkness was not the girl I had fallen in love with so long ago. I could hardly recognize her. Sleep eluded me, and I managed only a troubled hour or two that night. At the break of dawn, I was out of bed, reaching out to my commanding officer to request emergency personal leave, a request he promptly granted without probing. Recognizing the urgency, I knew I had limited time to formulate an exit strategy. Later that same day, I gathered the squad at Mike's, ensuring the other wives were occupied elsewhere. Once the door closed, I completely broke down and disclosed everything. The affairs, the revelations, all of it. Understandably, they were utterly shocked. The room became a whirlwind of furious pacing, shouting, swearing, cycling through every possible emotion. Confusion, disbelief, rage, profound grief. I had to talk a couple of the guys down from storming out to confront their own wives. However justified that felt in the moment, we realized we needed to be smart and not let on too soon. We were making progress until we solidified an airtight plan. Mike cracked open some whiskey, and we hashed out the details, each blow hitting painfully hard as the full weight of this bombshell revelation sank in. My brothers commiserated with me, offering unwavering support as I recounted every devastating new detail I had learned. They stood by me emotionally when I was at the absolute lowest point in my life, assuring me that I bore no responsibility for Sarah's choices. Their steadfast loyalty, even in the face of news that implicated their own wives, deeply moved me. In our shared state of anguish, we began strategizing that night on how best to confront this horrific situation. A couple of the guys, drawing on their tech expertise from their military backgrounds, helped me analyze the recording and tracking data. Over the next couple of agonizing days, I meticulously gathered evidence through hidden cameras and voice recorders discreetly installed around our house and in her car. We combed through phone records, 
credit card statements, and other paper trails as my newly retained divorce attorney had advised me to do. It was grueling work, but absolutely necessary. A few other squad members tapped into their informants and sources to help identify some of the men Sarah had been seeing on the site. Within just 72 hours, we had names and addresses for three different guys she had been hooking up with over the past year. Just seeing their faces and knowing what they had done with my wife made me physically ill. This pain was unlike anything I had experienced, even in combat. By the end of that grueling week of leave, we had assembled an ironclad case against Sarah. I consulted with a divorce attorney who assured me that I had substantial grounds to file for divorce immediately based on her adultery. With confidence, she predicted that I would likely be granted the house, no spousal support, and protection of my full military pension. Sarah would only receive half of our joint savings account balance, a small price to pay for liberation from her deceit. The final step was to confront Sarah with the truth. We agreed it needed to happen swiftly before rumors spread and Sarah or any of the other wives had a chance to manipulate the narrative. In the meantime, I did my best to maintain a facade of normalcy around Sarah, though it became increasingly difficult each passing day. As I gazed into the eyes of the woman, I once thought I knew, I saw only a conniving stranger staring back at me. We coordinated meticulously with the other wives to ensure they would all be occupied or out of town on D-Day, when the truth would finally come to light. As the moment approached, I took Sarah out for a pleasant dinner that evening at one of her favorite downtown restaurants. I forced myself to hold her hand across the table, faking affection. After dinner, I suggested a drive out to the scenic bluffs on the outskirts of town, where we parked at the top overlooking the glittering lights of the city below. It was time. We need to talk, I said quietly, still gazing out at the breathtaking view, bracing myself for the impending storm. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the color drain from Sarah's face. She immediately sensed that something was amiss. When I finally turned to look her squarely in the eye, her expression betrayed her fear of what I was about to reveal. The room, once a sanctuary of shared dreams, now transformed into a stage for confrontation. With calm resolve, I laid bare the truth, the air crackling with the tension of revelation. Each word I spoke carrying the weight of undeniable evidence meticulously gathered, and the divorce proceedings already set in motion. The emotional dialogue began as I articulated the undeniable details of her affairs. My words, heavy with truth, fell into the room like stones. Each fracture, marking a crack in the foundation of trust. Sarah stands before me. Her eyes, once a reflection of shared moments, now listen with the pain of realization. As my words slice through the carefully constructed facade, her world crumbles. As expected, the silence is shattered by Sarah's immediate reaction. The emotional dialogue shifts to her tears, a cascade of emotion breaking forth like a dam, echoing through the room. In the midst of her tears, Sarah's raw expression of remorse and desperation unfolds. She attempts to justify her actions, desperately pleading to explain the inexplicable. Her swearing that the affairs meant nothing is a futile attempt to downplay the gravity of her actions. With a raised hand, I silence her, balancing the panicked symphony of her justifications. The room falls into a hush tension thick in the air as the emotional dialogue pauses. My gaze, a mixture of sorrow and resolve, meets hers. The weight of truth hangs heavily in the air, each moment of silence pregnant with realization. In this moment, the foundations of our shared life crumble. The rue becomes a theater of shattered trust and broken promises. The emotional dialogue now a discordant melody of betrayal. In the calm before the storm, we await the resolution that will inevitably reshape our lives. Please. Don't compound betrayal by insulting my intelligence with more lies, I said evenly to Sarah. It's over. Our marriage has been over for a long time. She begged and pleaded with me, insisting she still loved me and we could work it out, go to counseling. I simply shook my head, repeating firmly that it was too late. The damage has been done and cannot be undone, I told her. Finally, 
I dropped the last bombshell. Not only did I know about her affairs, but so did all of my squad mates and their wives too. Her whole web of secrets had been laid bare. Her face turned ghostly white as she realized she could no longer keep lying to our social circle about why our marriage was ending. I laid out my expectations clearly. She would not contest the divorce, and she would refrain from fabricating some sympathetic narrative, painting me as the bad guy. She reluctantly agreed, seeing she had no other options left. Calmly, I got back in my truck and left her there on that cliff, subbing into her hands. I'm not ashamed to admit I broke down and cried too, as soon as I got home, as the gravity of it all finally hit. Beneath the searing hurt, I'd also experienced an immense wave of relief. No more secrecy, no more lies. I was finally free. The divorce itself unfolded fairly smoothly, just as my attorney had predicted. There were no disputes over property, alimony, or safeguarding my pension. Sarah cooperated fully once she realized it was her only viable option. I believe her parents also pressured her to expedite the process, avoiding a prolonged court battle and the exposure of her indiscretions. Despite my instructions for discretion, she couldn't resist venting emotionally on social media about feeling victimized and misunderstood. However, our closest friends saw through her attempts to save face. The initial couple of months following those tumultuous two weeks were undeniably challenging for me. Despite the relief of closing that traumatic chapter, the pain, anger, and bitterness lingered on some days. It took every ounce of willpower to resist drowning my sorrows in alcohol. Yet, I knew I had to stay resilient, relying on the unwavering support of my military brothers to carry me through my darkest moments. We probably all could have benefited from professional counselling to process everything, but there's still a strong stigma attached to seeking help in our line of work. So we supported each other as best we could through it all. You might be wondering about the fate of my brothers in arms and their wives after everything unravelled. Every relationship ultimately has its own complex story, but here's a quick summary. Mike's wife initially denied everything, then tried to blame it on his PTSD and workaholism. When confronted with the evidence, they are now in the midst of a messy and contentious divorce, but Mike is staying resilient and standing firm. Steve's wife, on the other hand, broke down and took responsibility when presented with proof, owning up to her actions. They are attempting to reconcile, although with mixed results. While the trust may be too damaged, Steve admires her honesty and willingness to admit fault, but the jury is still out on whether they'll make it. As for Trevor's wife, she resorted to manipulative tactics, claiming she strayed because she felt lonely and unloved due to his long deployments. Despite her crocodile tears, Trevor is moving forward with the divorce. Her excuses do not change the betrayal. Regarding Mark, the most heart-wrenching revelation was discovering his young son wasn't biologically his. Mark cherished that boy more than anything, so the deception cut deep. Now he's redirecting his care and attention to his older daughter from his first marriage, focusing on what he can change instead of dwelling on what can't be undone. And then there's Greg. His wife attempted to justify her actions by citing mental health issues and self-medicating with affair partners. Greg, being the empathetic soul he is, is giving her a chance. They're trying therapy as a couple before deciding on divorce. I hope, for both their sakes, it leads to healing, but I remain cautious. In summary, no two situations were the same, but the common thread was infidelity, with spouses scrambling to cover their tracks when caught. As for my ex, I doubt she ever felt genuine remorse. Regardless, I'm proud of my squad brothers. Despite their partner's betrayals, they've shown remarkable courage and resilience. Our bond is stronger than ever, and we'll weather this storm together, just as we always do. Gradually, I began to regain my sense of purpose and optimism for the future. I reconnected with old hobbies and passions that I had neglected during my unhappy years with Sarah. Additionally, I started volunteering more with local veterans charities, which proved tremendously rewarding and healing. Most importantly, 
I took the time I needed to rediscover myself outside of our failed marriage, to reconnect with the person I was at my core before compromising to accommodate someone who was poisoning my spirit. It was a long road, but every step was worth it. These days, I hardly recognize the shell of the man I became by the end of my marriage to Sarah. I'm proud to say I've reclaimed my self-confidence, humor, passions, and integrity. Life isn't perfect, but it feels beautifully hopeful again. While I'll always carry scars from what happened, my story is ultimately one of empowerment in overcoming deceit. Even in the midst of devastation, there's always a way to pick up the pieces, rebuild, and emerge stronger than before. I wish her well as I chose to move forward without bitterness or spite. As challenging as that was at times. The private investigators my attorney recommended unearthed the harsh truth. Her affairs persisted with multiple men for months after I left. In reality, she was the one who suffered the most from her lies being exposed. About a year later, I crossed paths with her by chance or grocery shopping. She appeared tired, a far cry from the vibrant, charismatic girl I once knew. Though she attempted a polite greeting, I simply nodded curtly and continued on with my cart. Some wounds heal but leave scars. My friend suggests I should start dating again when the time is right. For now, I'm content focusing on my squad, my work, and other goals. I gig my all in my marriage, compromised, sacrificed, and fought hard. I have no regrets, but I've also learned that some things just can't and shouldn't be salvaged. The key is having the wisdom to discern the difference. If there's one lesson I've learned through it all, it's to trust your gut. Never let anyone convince you that what you know deep down is wrong. Gaslighting and manipulation can distort reality and make you doubt yourself. Don't succumb to it, believe in your inner truth. These musings may seem rather philosophical for a tough military man, so I'll wrap this up for now.